A very good afternoon to everybody. On behalf of Father Dinesius Vas, the provincial of Karnataka Jesuit province and the Samagra team, I extend a very warm welcome to all present here. A special welcome to our guests for today and also all the members of our management who have joined us. This webinar on virus, vaccines and coping is organized by Samagra a team of mental health professionals across all Jesuit institutions. And during these tough times, we are coordinating our activities with the Karnataka Jesuit province to offer healthcare in terms of holistic health, mental health, and support. Under its two wings, Samagra offers mental health awareness and mental health support. We are conducting various programs like webinars, counseling, uh, skills training, self-care and holistic health activities, along with providing online support to individuals and group. The aim is to reach out to as many people as we can and empower them to take care of themselves better. And to Before we begin, let me now invite Ms. Sylvia Fernandez to lead us in prayer. Over to you, Ms. Sylvia. Let's place ourselves in the presence of God. Dear Almighty and ever-loving God, we glorify and thank you for bringing us together as a family as we participate in this webinar. We humbly ask you to bless our resource persons so that they may share the most of their knowledge with us. We pray that we absorb the invaluable knowledge and put it into practice what we may learn today. Bless all the efforts of the organizers of this event so that they may be able to reach out to all those who need help. Your infinite blessings would mean the success of this webinar. We also pray for the people who are infected with COVID-19 May they feel, feel your presence and powerful healing and protect their families and friends and bring peace to all those who love them. We make this prayer in your most holy name. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Sylvia. This webinar is one of our first programs in an effort to address some of the pressing concerns we are facing today currently. We are fortunate to have with us to highly experienced and senior people in the field of mental health, Dr. S. Kalyana Sundaram and Dr. Lata Hemchand. Please allow me to introduce them to you. Dr. S. Kalyana Sundaram is currently the Honorable Advisor of Richmond Fellowship Society, Bangalore branch. He studied medicine in Madras University, followed by an MD in psychiatry from Nimhans, Bangalore in the year 1975. He was a faculty member at Nimhans and also has his private practice since 1981. He was the Honorable CEO of Richmond uh, Fellowship Society for 30 long years since 1989 till 2019. With, uh, Richmond Fellowship Society is an organization involved in psychiatric rehabilitation. He has also held the post of the Professor of Psychiatry and the Principal of Richmond Fellowship PG College from the year 1999 to 2015. He has authored chapters in PG textbooks of psychiatry and medicine, along with publishing several research articles. He has received several awards, including the Eminent Psychiatrist Award by uh, IPS KC 2005. He was the finalist of the Bangalorean of the Year 2013 he has also received WAPR Indian Chapter Award for Excellence in Psychosocial Rehabilitation in 2016. He has got the American Psychiatric Society Award for Dedicated and Distinguished Leadership in 2019. He has also been honored by the IPS for contribution to psychosocial rehabilitation recently in December 2020. We are indeed very honored to have you, sir. We welcome you to our program. Uh, Dr. Lata Hemchand is presently the CEO and secretary of Richmond Fellowship Society, Bangalore branch. 
He is a practicing clinical psychologist for the last 35 years. He has a PG diploma in medical and social psychology from NIMHANS and a PhD in psychology focusing on the area of student mental health and counseling. She has worked at uh, St. John's, St. Martha's Hospital, Wokhart Hospitals, and also been a professor at the Richmond Fellowship PG College for Psychosocial Rehabilitation. She is involved in the rehabilitation of people with chronic mental illness from the last 15 years at the Richmond Fellowship Society. She's a consultant to the South India AIDS Action Program, an NGO that's working for prevention and care of HIV AIDS. She has worked as a trainer at the state and national level programs and brought out manuals for counselor training. He has worked as a coordinator for formulating a supervisory system for HIV AIDS counselors throughout Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. He has worked closely with the Department of Health Education in NIMHANS and KNAPS to train counselors and counseling supervisors. Presently, she is the CEO. And uh, Ma'am has also been a consultant a trainer in the area of stress uh, management workshops chronic diseases, lifestyle management for various organizations like Wipro, ABP, uh, Convergis, Emphasis, Accenture, Symphony, Socrates Software, Brigade Group, and NIFT in Bangalore, just to name a few. She's also widely published in the area of her interest, uh, family therapy, marital therapy, alternative sexualities, process variables in therapy, training and supervising counselors, and spirituality and health. Ma'am, we are also very honored to have you uh, and we are looking forward to gain some insights from your vast experience. With that being said, I would like to once again welcome our guests and express our gratitude for them having taken out time for this webinar and agreeing to share their insights and their experience with us today. Over to you all. I invite Dr. Kalyana Sundaram to begin. During the webinar, if the participants have any questions, you all can post your questions in the chat box. We will be monitoring them and asking them at the end of the session. So once we hear both these speakers, then we will take questions towards the end. The viewers on YouTube can also post your uh, questions in the chat over there and we will moderate at the end of the session. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. Thank you, Samakara, Karnataka Jesuits Association, and Reka for making this happen. And um, Reka introduced us very, um, you know, generously. The topic I've chosen to talk about is myths and facts about virus and vaccines. And not a day pass, passed in the last year and a half almost that we do not think we do not dream, we do not get worried, we do not get scared. We are panicking about the virus, the impact it has had on people, someone very dear and near to you. And we must understand what this virus is all about. Why are we so scared and frightened about it? What is the virus doing to us? Or rather, what are we doing to this virus? All information in this talk is based on scientific evidence. And it is not from WhatsApp University information. No conflict of interest. I have no shares in any vaccine company. It's factual and it is not prescriptive. So what do we know about this coronavirus? It's a crown-like appearance under the electron microscope. And therefore, it is called corona, as you see it on the left side of the screen. It's an enveloped RNA virus. SARS virus was originally seen in 2002 and 2003. Middle Eastern virus was seen in 2012, but the new novel coronavirus was initially uh, known to humans in 2019. This has a lot of intermediary hosts and it has hosts initially like a 
canine, pigs, camel, pangolin. Now, this pangolin is what is responsible for coronavirus. As most of you know, that this is originally seen in Wuhan market. Some of you must have seen those horrifying pictures where people go to buy the stuff. And from there, this began to appear in human being. Beyond China, the first case was reported in Italy in 2012. Sorry, yeah, last year, 2020 in the month of February. Somebody traveled from China to Italy, from there it went to Europe, and from there it went to USA, and some person started entering India, and lo and behold, before we knew what happened, and it started enveloping all the countries. SARS, this virus, it has several ways of entering. First, it, it infects the body. After some time, the disease appears in the individual. We look at the symptoms. And when the disease is not controlled or it gets worse and it progresses to the lung and actually in some people, death happens. Compared to the first wave, the second wave seems to be killing a lot more people. We will understand why. Fortunately, a large number actually recover. We will have figures now to show you. Less number of people die and most people recover. Unfortunately, what the media talks about is not about recovery, but it talks about death. In the laboratory, we diagnose through what we call RT-PCR tests. Once a diagnosis is made, we have an epidemiological surveillance to find out roughly what percentage of people seem to get affected. Then once it is diagnosed, it is staged into initial stage. How do we prognose this condition? What happened during therapeutic monitoring? I'll come to some practical issues. The only way one can prevent this disease is to be careful. The only way one can actually ward off this disease is to be careful, doubly, triply careful. Now, we all are asked to wear masks. Some do, some don't. Some of you who do, they do not do it correct way. These are simple methods I want to show it to you. Wearing a mask that fits tightly on your face can help limit spread of the virus that causes COVID-19. This is a other it lab tests with dummies exposed to the potentially infectious aerosol for 95% when both were tightly fitted mask. The important thing is the mask must be tightly fitted over the nose. It cannot and should not hang down. If it keeps hanging down, you see people lifting it and putting it over the nose. And they bend, it falls down. They move their head, it falls down. Other effective options include mask fitter. You will find some of the masks have a kind of a metallic fitter. You put it over the nose and you press it. It should come to the half the bridge of your nose, somewhere here and not here. If you leave it here at the tip of the nose, it's going to fall off. It should fit here. Then there's metallic clip. You press it, it will stay put. What are the do's and don'ts? How do you do not adjust the mask by touching it once you put it there? Cover your, it should cover your nose mouth and chin. Avoid touching the mask. Clean your hands before removing the mask. Before using the mask, clean your mask with a sanitizer. You pull the mask by taking it from your ears like this, both like this, and not like this. Because the minute you have touched it, you have soiled it. Remove the mask by straps when taking out of the bag. Put it inside a clean, back there, if it is not too soiled, but if it is already soiled, wash it in warm water, soap, dry, and iron. Do not wear a mask like this where you have exposed the nose. This is a portion through which the virus actually enters your nose. Do not remove the mask where there are other people within one meter. If people are near you, can you hear me? Hello? 
Somebody is talking. Can you mute, please? That's so. Mute the mask whether it starts behind the ears or head. Can you? Hello. Can you mute? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Do not remove the mask while there are other people within one meter. Do not use a mask that is difficult to breathe through it. Do not wear a dirty or a wet mask. If it is dirty like this, then take it out and wash it. I have a very um, fondness for this mask, this picture. Wearing mask properly and continuously with interacting with others against COVID-19. Look at this distance. It is 1.5 meter, which is six feet. If two people are not wearing a mask while you're talking the, and breathing, the droplets travel. When the droplets travel from back and forth, the risk of infection is 90% from either of you. If one person is wearing a mask, suddenly it is dropped to 30%. That means this person is spreading the virus you are not protecting yourself, you have a chance of a 90% risk. This person is still spreading the virus. You are wearing the mask. It is not reaching beyond the mask to your nose or mouth. So you reduce your chance, but still you are vulnerable. This person is wearing the mask. The one who is infected, this gentleman is not wearing the mask because the person is covering the face the risk is only 5%, that is infected person. If both of you, the infected person is wearing a mask, the other person standing against the person is also wearing the mask, the chance of infection is only 1.5%, which means from both of you not wearing a mask, infected person giving it to you, and when both of you are wearing it, you have reduced it considerably less. What are the symptoms of COVID one is likely to experience? You all know by now the symptoms, fever, headache, cold, running nose, dry cough, throat irritation, breathlessness, fatigue, extreme fatigue, body ache, myalgia means body muscle pain, diarrhea, uneasiness in the stomach, diarrhea because it has already entered your stomach, recent loss of smell or taste. When these things happen, usually people tell us, I had an ice cream the other day, I had a cold drink that day, therefore my throat is irritated, therefore I'm coughing. <coughs> this kind of a cough. And people tend to dismiss it because they do not want to admit the fact it could be beginning of COVID. Please understand, only 5% of the people infected with COVID become critical. That means 95% are not critical. 14% become severe. Only about four-fifths have only mild disease. But what the media is not talking about them, they are talking about this and showing you frightening pictures. The first symptom happens within the first two days. You have headache, fever, any one of those symptoms. Some people, this is the first symptom for them, loss of smell. By slowly, if there is no intervention, by seventh day, you develop dyspnea means difficulty in breathing. You take a few steps, you seem to be uh, struggling to breathe and you begin to have cough. You're climbing steps. Normally you would have climbed three, four steps, three, four stairs, half a staircase, you are stopping and then <sighs> holding breath and asking, no, no, nothing. Today was a little tired, therefore, now by then, the disease has entered you. If you do not take care of it, then you end up being in a hospital because your oxygen saturation drops. You all know about oximeter. Oximeter is something it is worth having everybody at home. Normally, it is anywhere between 95 and 98 or 99 in room air, what we call a room air. And during this time, the oxygen saturation drops. It drops to 94, 93, 90, 88. If it comes anywhere below 93, when you have this kind of symptoms, you are in trouble. Below 90, you will definitely be requiring hospitalization. 93, you are alerting 
you are talking to your doctor and say do i need to go to the hospital because you have ignored all of your symptoms by then acute respiratory distress syndrome happens by eighth day by this situation you will need hospitalization if the oxygen saturation is below 93 i want to look at all of this this illness can affect neurological conditions kidney kidney problem it can cause liver problem gastrointestinal problem skin allergy or skin rashes or small red dots in the skin it can cause increase sugar or less sugar cardiac problem myopathy cardiac arrhythmia that mean irregularity of the heart and sometimes blocking of blood vessels which means this disease can affect the entire spectrum of your body louis pasteur the famous person who talked about germs he said the germ is nothing but the terrain is everything the virus or any other organism is sitting quiet but we go and invite them we go and invite them and say please come and meet me come and be with me the terrain is everything the germ is nothing terrain meaning in this context us warning by scientists have been ignored many factors are contributing super spreading events crowding rallies and elections religious events now why is we why is that we in spite of the doctors and experts cautioning us why do we need an election rallies during this covid period thousands and thousands of people lakhs of people are gathering and if you notice the pictures in the tv majority are not even wearing masks they are practically sitting on each other's laps there is such a lot of crowding election rallies and religious events you just think about whatever religion people congregate in large numbers when people do not understand the value of advice from scientists poor planning and by the time they came to know system responded very late so what are the myths corona virus will not survive in india because we are a tropical country completely wrong new strains have made the virus deadly no the new mutated virus and the what is seen in the second wave in the first wave virus the fatality rate is similar there is no increase in fatality because of the new virus older people are the greater risk during the first wave younger people and children are now at higher risk there is no evidence that young being at greater risk the second wave 70% of hospitalized cases are still above 40 years age average age of patients in the first wave of 50 and the second wave is 49 not much of a difference the icmr study rt pcr test is not detecting mutant 19 covid 19 strains not true at all it's a standard testing there is no chance of missing detection by any mutant virus by this test hospitalization is necessary after testing positive some people we know they get into such a panic they get the test report immediately they panic and rush around going to the hospital running after beds and calling people whom they know can i get the bed for me can i get the bed for me no need at all most people 80% of the people as i told earlier require home isolation and 14 days of home quarantine inhaling steam hot water will kill the virus no it will higher the degree of temperature it will kill some of the tissues inside your nose inhaling steam does not kill the virus but respiratory hygiene social distancing washing hands are effective measures temperature higher than 25 degrees will kill the virus no it will not 5g mobile network will spread the virus it is not true virus has nothing to do with the mobile mobile cells mobile uh, network if you hold your breath for 10 seconds or more without coughing you don't have covid not true at all what is helpful though if you have a oxygen saturation little less what is called proning is something you can do proning means lying on your stomach 20 30 minutes at a time that seems to improve your oxygen saturation covid 
is not a threat until you are older. No, young or old, the threat is the same. Once you have COVID, you have it forever, not through it all. The standard normal period where people get affected for COVID is about two weeks. By the time if you are free of symptoms for one week and you have spent 14 days in isolation, last one week with absolutely no symptom, you are relatively free. Okay. Some of the COVID-19 vaccines, how do they compare? Astra, Venega, two injections, effective between 62 to 90 percent, Moderna 95 percent, but it has to be kept in 20 degree minus temperature. This is a regular refrigeration temperature. RNA, Pfizer, Sputnik is 92 percent effective, and our own Bharat Biotech is about 70 to 80 percent effective. Person that passes your COVID infection and are RT pass here, PCR, following condition can be vaccinated. History of chronic disease, metabolic disease, renal and malignancies, immunodeficiency. Anybody with this kind of conditions can be infected. People keep asking, can we get vaccination or not when you have past history of any disease? Side effects, I've already talked about it. Mild pain, mild chill, headache, tiredness, flu-like symptoms, uncommon, very, very rare. Again, wear a mask. Generally, waves are spread to three to five months apart. So please expect a third wave sometime in October to December. And this time, the third wave, it is likely to hit young children. So we do not have vaccination for children. If adults are vaccinated, children may be exposed. We have to be extra cautious. No matter what the media says, please understand, looking at all the countries, India has the least percentage of fatality. Do not go by numbers because we have confirmed exact numbers here. So confirmed numbers, maybe actual numbers may be more, but the percentages are less. This is remarked from John Hopkins as early as a week ago. I want you to listen to this little story of this lady. I am 97 years old. I took my first dose of vaccination on March 9th. I felt no pain or even side effects. Now my second dose is due on May 9th. I am waiting for that. Don't be afraid. Take the vaccination. It is good for you and others around you. It is safe. If this message cannot convince you, I do not know what can. Now, for those of you who are fed via WhatsApp University, the organization of this group is giving you a degree. This is certified that Indian public who refuse to wear a mask, refuse vaccination, refuse to stay home, and now blames the doctors and the government has successfully completed the required course of study approved by the board of WhatsApp groups and forwards and is therefore awarded this degree of Doctor of Medicine. I hope none of you will get this degree. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge the my help from Professor Ravi, neurovirologist of repute, Emeritus Professor of Nimans, from whom I have borrowed a lot of studies. I would like to end, end this with this quote. Health is your right. If you want to suffer, that is your option. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Dr. Lata. Ma'am, I invite you. Thank you, Rekha. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, you're clear. You can share your screen and begin. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, Samagra and all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts with you. So at the outset, I know we've been hearing a lot and talking a lot about uh, COVID and its effects. But what I would like to start with <clears throat> is on a positive note. So 
though Dr. Kalyan Sundaram has told you in detail about the medical and the uh, physical impact of COVID on people, what I would like to share with you is for the first time, I think in history, we are talking about mental health more openly. We are willing to talk about mental health more openly. I think COVID has pushed us into that space where, you know, you have no other uh, go but to discuss and see, find solutions. So uh, that is one positive part, I think, of having had this pandemic. There are some others too, I mean, the positive sides. <clears throat> like, I think we have learned to slow down and look within and reflect about our lives, the priorities of our lives. It, COVID has forced us to think, rethink about our priorities. So I think in a way, I mean, I'm not saying that all the effects of the pandemic as I'll be going on now is good or positive, but I think quite uh, these two points definitely uh, make an impact. So what, how does it influence our daily lives? If you look at it, you know, even a person who is not infected, but wants to protect himself or herself. So I hear a lot of people saying, 150 slots get booked in 30 seconds. How are you supposed to get the OTP? How can I log in and uh, see that I get registered? So these are, I mean, this is a pressure that everybody is going through, especially the ones below 45. I think they're struggling to get the vaccines. There is incessant negative news about ever raising numbers of COVID positive cases, shortage of, shortage of oxygen, shortage of beds. So we only hear the negatives from media, which is uh, really unhelpful. It only makes people get even more stressed. And in fact, some of my clients who are anxious as it is, they have anxiety disorder. I've told them not to watch the news at all. If they need to know something current, they can specifically go to it on the net and find out. There is also the sudden loss of lives both near and far, people who are very close to you, people who you're not related to, but you constantly keep seeing these bodies and uh, funerals and so on on the TV. There is also isolation and loneliness due to lockdown. So all of us are in our own shell and there is very little chance for us to socialize like before. So socializing was a way of coping and that is no longer there. So this results in stress, helplessness, and feeling out of control. So in these times, what do we see as the sources of stress in the pandemic? So there are different categories of people. So people who have serious symptoms of COVID, people who are admitted to ICU, for example, they may be suffering from fears of death. They may feel that they have a lot of unfinished business, like children to get married or debts to clear or some other commitment which they feel very uh, close to and they're not able to complete it. And uncertainty about future. Will I really live? Can I really get out of the ICU? And then worries of the family. So what will they do without me? How will they manage? If I, have, if I have to uh, die here, then what will my family face? These are some of the things that people with serious symptoms go through. People who are asymptomatic, but still are COVID positive, they have uncertainty about future. They don't know whether this will lead to some other disease. This will lead to some, uh, you know, so there is so much of uh, spread about uh, the negative impact of after post covid syndromes and so on you have the um, you know the new black uh, uh, the the eye problem that people are talking about then so uncertainty about being isolated being isolated that because you're quarantined and you don't have contact with your near dear ones there's a sense of loneliness and 
what will happen to me, the constant worry, negative thoughts. Uh, will my job be still there for me? Will I lose my job? And things like that. People who are not infected, but are caring for people who are infected. So worry is about protecting elders and children in the family that is constantly there and keeping the family together in a way that is physically and mentally healthy for the whole family. I think that's a big challenge for many of us. People who, who, who have lost near and dear ones, what's happening to them? I think there's a lack of space and time to process their normal grieving. We all know that in any religion, for that matter, we have a lot of um, rituals with, associated with death and dying. And these rituals help us to accept someone's loss and deal with it because you have your dear ones around you trying to support you. So the grieving process gets naturalized. But here in COVID times, I think that time or space, people don't even get to see their loved ones who have died. So it is a terrible situation. And I think loss and grief will become in future a very complicated issue. So there is also survivor guilt. Those who are watching people die, they feel there is guilt because why should I not have been affected? Why is it my spouse passed away or my child passed away and so on? And then overwhelmed by the burden of responsibility. So now that maybe the breadwinner of the family is no more or someone who is very, who's the anchor for the family is not there, how to carry on this burden of the family. Apart from this, the bystanders, all, all of us, large majority of people who are in the middle of this crisis. We are watching everything. We're witnessing the chaos and helplessness all around. And we feel helpless to do anything else. So this is the scenario that's going on. So we often talk, I mean, today, I think this has become a mantra, the new normal. So for everything, we have the new normal. Now, what is this new normal? I mean, if you really look at it, if you look at the old normal, when we had our jobs nine to five, we used to commute, we used to go through predictable stresses like the traffic, the pollution, the you know rush of going and coming back, and uh, yes, maybe overworking and so on. But now there is no predictability for the stress that we face. Every day it is a new thing. It could be, you know, uh, there is no daily routine. There are no domestic health. There is uh, job insecurity and uh, about health and getting COVID. I mean, there is, the worry is just enormous. And because of this constant worry, we are going through in our mind, a flight and fight reaction. Many of you may be familiar with this. Uh, what I mean, uh, whenever we undergo stress, there is a mechanism where we either want to fight with the whatever the stressful situation is or fly from it. That's how our system is made. But it's more for the physical danger, physical threat. But right now, what we are facing is all these negative information and fear of getting infected and so on, which is not anything physical. So therefore, this flight and fight reaction remains as an impediment rather than allowing you to think clearly and judge what to do and find solutions to whatever you're facing. So this flight fight reaction has become a constant in all our lives today because of COVID. Then many people spend long hours online without any human interaction. People who stay away from their native place, for example, the parents are in another place, but they are working here in Bangalore. Therefore, you know, they're glued to their uh, laptops. Then work from home. Is it really a boon or a bane? I think we need to look at it. Some of, some of the people would say that it is a boon because we don't have a commute. It's a flexible time. We get a little more time with our 
family. But a large portion of people I have seen complaining that they are not able to draw boundaries between work and home anymore because it all gets mixed up, this flexible timing. So 24 hours I feel I'm working is what they say. And then there are distractions because you're at home, you're called for something or the other. There are children who also don't have much to do. They are cooped up and therefore they demand attention. So work from home for most people, I think is a bane. Then there is isolation and sadness. So the human contact, if it is virtual, I, I feel that the same impact is not there. You don't feel real about it. And that, that humanness, human connect is missing in our lives now. So as you can see, the new normal has more questions and very few answers. So how do people react in a, in a, in a crisis generally? What I would like to say at the outset is people differ in their reactions. There are individual differences between how people look at crisis from one person to another. So usually they depend on the nature and severity of the event. So in my earlier slide, I showed you those people who are you know, seriously ill in the ICU or people who have lost a near and dear ones. That would be a very severe event to go through. While a person who's asymptomatic or just you know, a bystander would not feel the crisis to that extent. So the nature of the event also decides how we react to the event. But of course, there are those people, exceptions, who thrive even if there is a severe crisis. I'll come to that example later. The experience of previous distressing events. I would just like to give you an example here of one of my clients who um, who has come to me for her depression uh, and uh, she's also a little anxious and uh, she had uh, tested positive recently. And I found to my amazement that she was taking it in her stride. She was not very anxious. She said, I'm taking all the medication and all the precautions and I have isolated myself from my family. I am doing all right. It's just that I don't know how to spend my time. So I'm finding it difficult. Otherwise, things are fine. So why was this so? A person who is anxious by nature, how come she's facing her positive COVID status so easily? That's because she has faced previously distressing events. For example, when she was newly married, she went through a severe, uh, severe case of uh, tuberculosis she went through. And uh, she came out of it, of course, but she had to then isolate herself and uh, keep away and, uh, from her husband. And the husband was very supportive and she came out of it uh, without much problems. But I think just the, the uh, shock of uh, thinking that immediately after her marriage, she landed up with tuberculosis and uh, she, she felt it was life-threatening at that time. So she had faced that. So having faced it, I think now when she was positive, that did not uh, make her too anxious. The support that they have in life, people, when they have social support, it's a big, big buffer for any kind of stress. So I think that makes a big difference to people when we can depend on somebody, when we know that there is someone who will care for us, I think it's a huge huge support. And uh, people's physical health also matters. So how healthy are they? Prior to uh, having this COVID, uh, were they having any comorbidities or were they already, you know, weak with their health? Supposing uh, the person was an asthmatic or a person who has had a cardiac problem. So people who have faced chronic illnesses like this, they're already, their stress tolerance comes down. So when they face a crisis like this, they are more likely to react severely. The other vulnerable group is those who have personal and family history of mental health problems. 
So if you already are vulnerable, then you're more likely to uh, decompensate under crisis. So I think the history of this is also important to uh, see whether the, how, how the people are facing the crisis. Then coming to the cultural background and traditions. So I think all of us, uh, I think we, without much exception, except for those who are very uh, strongly agnostic, maybe, whenever we face crisis, the first thing we do is to pray, pray to God, you know, and I think it comes very natural to us and prayer somehow, and there's been a lot of research on that as well, that prayer can, um, when a person prays with faith, the immunity of the person increases. So people who have some religious practices uh, to face whatever they're going through, they do much better, at least stress-wise, mentally, than those who do not have that. I would just like to give you one example here of a friend of mine who is living presently in a, a, a little remote farm. Uh, he has a farm there and he's living there. And he developed uh, fever. He's already having comorbid, comorbidities like diabetes and hypertension. And he developed fever over there. And then uh, after three, four days, he called me up to say, I don't know what to do because there is no transport here and I'm not able to drive because I'm running 102, 103 temperature. There's no one to take me even to test what is happening. There was a doctor coming, but he's also stopped. So I don't know what to do. So I told him, you have to get an ambulance. And uh, I made some arrangements for him to get admitted in Mysore because that place was closer to Mysore. So we did all this the previous night. And the next morning he calls me up and he says, my fever, fever is gone and I'm feeling so much better. I sweated through the night. I couldn't sleep. So when I couldn't sleep, I was, he's a Sai Baba uh, devotee. So he said, when I could not sleep, I just went on praying. And then the Sai Baba, uh, what is that? Uh, Vibhuti, which we call uh, that ashes that they uh, have, that he put it in hot water and he said, I drank it three times. And then now I'm feeling the fever is not there and I'm fine. So I know that whatever infection he had, luckily he didn't have, later he was tested and found to be negative. But whatever infection he had, I know wouldn't have completely gone with just, uh, you know, drinking that hot water with ashes. But belief, you know, belief and faith can do a lot to people, people's health. So I think we need to keep that in mind. And finally, the age of the person. So the elderly and the young children are, I think, most vulnerable in these situations. So elderly, of course, uh, as it is, they have less stress tolerance. And when they have to face COVID-like crisis, I think they just break down. And children, children, I think they are feeling most um, caged up and uh, they are showing all kinds of unnatural reactions, tem temper tantrums and, you know, getting very moody. Uh, normal children who are otherwise playful they are going through all this and this can have a long lasting effect unless we do something about it. So let's now see what are the general psychological reactions when a person undergoes stress. So person who is undergoing stress generally has emotional outbursts. I mean, they need a small trigger to get upset, angry. We all snap when we are in a tension. We tend to snap more. Then there's excessive fear and worry and confusion. Then increased anxiety, ruminative and obsessive thoughts. So repetitive, what we mean by ruminative obsessive thoughts is that the same negative thoughts keep repeating in your mind and you keep going over it again and again. This, this what if this happens and this leads to something more and something more and then it never ends. So that is rumination, you know, like the, like the cow which keeps uh, uh, chewing the cud Similarly, our mind keeps going over and over again 
on this negative line of thinking. So decrease self-confidence. So when things are going wrong, we always feel I may not be able to uh, face it. I may not be able to overcome this. Then the mind is completely um, rushed with thoughts. So you can't switch off. You can't sleep. There is also poor concentration. And the other thing that happens is we make wrong lifestyle choices. Like sometimes we do stress eating or get into alcohol. Uh, so the lifestyle choices which could help you to for a better health, you seem to have left them behind and tend to, tend to choose the wrong ones. Neg negative self-image is also something that happens because you feel like a failure in the, in the midst. So you're so overwhelmed by the negativity of the whole uh, environment that you start losing confidence in yourself. Then there are mental traps like the guilt trap, like the uh, trap of perfectionism. So we start feeling guilty that I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing things the, the right way. Even if I cook a small thing for my family, it should, it should be perfect. It can't go wrong and so on. So all these are mental traps which only increase your stress. So what are the special issues which have come up during the pandemic? So uh, what research shows is that there is increase in domestic violence, both against women and children. Children's helpline has been, you know, the, the number of calls they have received is enormous. Uh, marital conflicts are on the rise. Worsening of mental health problems. Of course, like I told you earlier, anxiety patients and people with obsessive compulsive disorders who already have washing compulsions and cleaning compulsions, they are definitely getting worse. Then increasing number of suicides, people are losing hope. And that's one of the reasons. Then there is increased intake of alcohol and drug. So how do we manage these complex problems, these special issues? I think for that you need referral to professionals. Uh, definitely networking with helplines, especially in the case of domestic violence, and then building awareness among the public. I think all these are necessary. So, special issues of women. I think women being the uh, on the receiving end most of the time, though things are changing a bit now, but still, the stereotypes continue. So women tend to neglect self-care. I mean, this has been researched upon enough. When they have some symptoms, when they have physical or mental symptoms, they tend to just swallow it and uh, not talk about it. Uh, because uh, the, the woman in our social stereotype uh, is supposed to be very sacrificing. She always has to put others before herself. I mean, all the soaps on the TV that we see, you know, sort of propagate this image. And therefore, you know, there is more neglect of self-care. Then the role conflict that the woman goes through, if she's a professional at work and home, how to balance it out, how to prioritize, should I be an ambitious, uh, you know, professional or should I be a, a loving mother and wife? So... How, how much time, how much effort to put into both is always a conflict for the woman. <clears throat> Fear of success is another uh, concept which plays with, with women that they, they are somewhat awkward to say that I earn more than my husband or I have a higher designation than my husband. So somewhere we put ourselves down as women. Uh, um, so that... Uh, also adds on to all the other problems. Some have uh, problems with childcare because they have to work and earn, and at the same time they feel, um, you know, drawn to the child who is at home. Uh, they feel guilty about it uh, that they have left the child at home and so on. Then there are super women who who feel that they can take on everything and anything. They try to take on more, they, more than they can swallow. 
and that puts them in stress. Lack of assertion is another quality in many women which makes them get more stressed and they have to uh, swallow the domination of others even when they're unfairly treated and so on. Discrimination, I think it's getting reduced, but it's still there. And then sexual harassment. So all these are problems which women generally face, but I think in this particular scenario and during the COVID times, these things are making it worse for them. So how do we manage this? How do we manage it wisely? So what I have, uh, the points that I have made here are more general and more applicable to everyone. I am not specifying it to a particular group of patients, a particular group of people. So the most important thing is the lifestyle changes. Like I told you, we make wrong lifestyle choices when we are under stress. We tend to feel that we need to indulge in things because we are going through so much stress. That's a very natural sort of uh, response. But I think lifestyle changes are the bedrock of building resilience. So even to build emotional resilience, we need these lifestyle changes. So what are they? So rather than stress eating or eating junk food uh, ordered from outside, I think selecting a healthful diet and eating right is important. One of the most uh, uh, significant things which I have seen in my own clinical practice, which helps most people under stress is rhythmic abdominal breathing. So hopefully you are all very familiar with this, you know, uh, using your abdominal muscles to breathe that relaxes both your mind and your body. So 10 deep breaths through abdominal breathing uh, helps in reducing your stress for the time. So wherever you are, whether you're at work, whether you're doing something, you can take that just small break to have these 10 deep breaths. And maintain a consistent sleep pattern. So when we have worries, we are unable to fall asleep. And when we, um, or we tend to watch the television because there's nothing else to do, or we keep going on our phone and uh, looking at the messages and so on. And we break the sleep pattern, which has been there consistently. And this again, makes you more vulnerable for stress. Exercising regularly. I think all these are stressed enough in all our, you know, health uh, by health health uh, experts, you know, how exercise matters a lot and exercise also helps in reducing stress. So exercise should not be once in a way and, you know, erratic. It should be regular. It should be part of your routine. And aerobic exercises are much more helpful. Now, what is the role of yoga in, in stress? Definitely it relieves stress and especially in the postures, because when we are stressed, we tend to not bother about the way we are sitting, the way we slump or the, the shoulders crouched and, you know, in a very awkward position we sit and all those can cause aches and pains, increase your stress. So yoga has a big role. Mindfulness. Now, I think many of you would have heard this word, but just to give you what it is all about. So mindfulness is being fully in the present with all your senses. So I want to ask, uh, ask you all a question. I would like you to think over it. How many of you uh, eat without watching the TV, with not being in front of the TV? Do you have your meals in front of the TV or not? So if you are doing that, then you are not eating mindfully. Uh, what it means is when you eat, it's a time to um, allow your body to uh, assimilate what you're eating. And the sense of smell, the sense of taste, all those have to work together to make you assimilate the food that you're eating and enjoy it. So food should be enjoyed in a mindful way. 
which I think is forgotten nowadays. And most of the people tend to watch TV and eat food. So they don't even know how much they eat or what they are eating, the taste of it and so on. So mindfulness, how does it help in stress? Because the flight and fight reaction that I was telling you about, that comes down when you are mindful because you are able to focus on all your senses, whatever experience you're getting from the senses, and that helps you to reduce your stress. In fact, mindfulness has been used to even reduce pain in cancer patients, for example. So I think it's a good thing if you practice mindfulness. Making sure to uh, take small breaks during long working hours. I think we work best. The brain research shows that we work be best if we take small breaks every now, now and then. Creating a work-life balance. I think this is also often used uh, word, but I don't know how far we are following, whether we are. So with the COVID, I think we need to rethink how should our work-life balance be? How do we draw a boundary between the two? I think that's a very important thing for us to think about. And then support system. So we've seen oh. a, again and again that health research has shown that people who have social support are much more healthier than people who are isolated, who are lonely, who are divorced, and so on. So support system plays a big role in reducing your stress. So safe space to express your emotions and having meaningful relationships, that makes a huge difference to face stress. And then finally, limit consuming the news on COVID, about COVID on the media. You can listen to experts like Dr. KS who just spoke to you or people who are in the medical field, but not to take in the news which comes directly from media. So there are some other coping strategies which help us. So there is this concept of hardiness in psychology, so which was given by Kobasa, who was doing a lot of research in health psychology. And what he found was that if people have these three C's, so control, commitment, and challenge. So what do we mean by this? A sense of control through belief in one's ability to influence situations. So for example, if I become positive, COVID positive, then I tell myself that if I take the right medication and since I have already gone through my vaccines, I should not, I need not go into very serious illness. So I can protect myself. I have made some uh, provision to protect myself and therefore I can influence that the COVID doesn't become serious. So I have an influence or control over my situation. I believe I have. So I, I gave you a simple example, but maybe there are others where you feel certain things are not in our control. So at such moments, what would help is to visualize a scenario where you are able to have that control. So visualizing is a powerful medium through which you can overcome this stress. A sense of commitment towards all action. So commitment is having a genuine concern about others, having a genuine commitment towards others. So whenever we feel committed, for example, <clears throat> the simple case of a mother towards the child, when the child is ill, the mother goes through sleepless nights. But does she complain? Does she feel the stress of losing her sleep, uh, she's more worried that the child should be all right. So because of her commitment towards this relationship, she does not feel the stress, the physical uh, hardship. So uh, approaching all problems as challenges. I would like to give the example of uh, Dr. KS. He's a great example to take crisis as a challenge. So just to give, tell you all, that he took this initiative to see that all our staff in Richmond Fellowship were vaccinated at the earliest, you know, and those who were uh, eligible for the two doses got the two doses. And he saw to it that under the healthcare worker category, all our staff 
did get their vaccination. So under challenging times, he he thrives into action. He thrives under challenges. So I think uh, he's a good example of that. And uh, I think I would also like to mention that I think Dr. Rekha here, who, who has been comparing, she herself has done a study on post-traumatic growth. So when there is trauma, there can also be an opportunity for growth. So let's remember that and look at, uh, you know, stress or crisis as a challenge and face it. That makes it much easier. Then finally, challenging the negative thoughts and beliefs. All of us have these negative thoughts. For example, I have to be competent and efficient at all times. Though it is a very seductive thought that I should be competent, but it makes you overwhelmed. And then when you feel that you make a small mistake, you start telling yourself, I'm a loser, I always goof up and so on. And these, these dialogues, that inner dialogues that we have about uh, generally about the way we look at things and our beliefs, they are the ones which cause us maximum stress. So how do we change these dialogues? How do we become more rational people? I think that is very important. Further, the coping strategies could be that you need to be more solution focused. What happens when we are overwhelmed with a crisis like how we are going through now, COVID? I think we just focus on the problem, problem, and then we magnify it so much. And we forget that there are solutions. We can focus on the solutions rather than problem becoming more. Why, why should it happen to me? Why, did, why do I have to go through all this? And so on and so forth. So we make the problem big and we don't look at the solution and that's not a good coping strategy. And like I said earlier also, I think anger becomes a huge problem. That's why we are seeing increase in violence against women uh, because the couples who were already fighting earlier had conflict. Uh, uh, there is a tendency now to become a little more aggressive and uh, violent behavior and so on. So we need to learn how to be assertive rather than angry. So there is a difference there. So when you're assertive, you're not emotional about the issue, but you are stating facts. Supposing you feel that you were unfairly treated, you are saying that you're unfairly treated without showing anger. Otherwise, what happens is people tend to take only the anger emotion and they don't look at the message that you're giving. And then I think we need to also have healthy communication. So, and avoid lizard listening. What do we mean by this lizard listening? So lizards or all reptiles have what is called the limbic brain. So the limbic brain is mainly involved in emotions, emotions like fear, anger, and uh, pain, and so on. So when we start listening with a prayer emotion, for example, let us say, even when we are irritated, we, we just want to stop the other person from talking because we are impatient at that time, to tell you simply. Or we, have, we carry an impression because of our limbic brain. We, we make a conclusion about a person. And then when they start talking, we always judge them based on that. Oh, this person is, you know, very um, authoritative or very demanding or whatever it is that you don't listen to the talk completely, but you tend to uh, form your own impression based on how you felt about the person and then uh, listen through that. So what we need to do now, we need to slow down and rethink about our life goals. So when we know that danger is always lurking behind, so what are my priorities now in life? What should I give more importance to? You know, I think that is that becomes very, very um, crucial at this time. Having conversations on mental wellness, like I said when I started my talk, that uh, you know, uh, mental health has now taken a center stage, which I'm very happy with because I think the stigma, hopefully, about our uh, clients who, who go through so much suffering, the stigma, I hope, gets taken away. 
So how do we keep this uh, conversation going? You can have, uh, uh, you know, sharing stories with each other, even virtually. What is your lockdown story and so on and connect with others in a meaningful way, which goes a long way in helping you to manage your stress. Then finally, I think people who are, sorry, how do I go back, uh, Rekha? I think I just... Um, Ma'am, you can just use the arrow keys. The page up arrow. Yeah. Or, or you could just say stop sharing and share okay. one. Okay, yeah, now it's visible. You can just use the arrow key to go back to the... Yeah, 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 yeah. correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> so this is uh, coming to the last slide. So I think people who are caring for the people with COVID, I think they also go through so much of burnout and uh, trying to you know, make sure that uh, others in the family are healthy. So these carers, all of you, I mean, I'm sure many of you would have faced this. I think it's very important to build a support network learn how to provide proper care from each other. Then take help from relatives. Don't be shy about asking for help from friends and relatives and join a support group. I think if it is a, a case of people who have lost somebody or someone who has uh, been going through a lot of, uh, uh, the person who is going through comorbidities and you have to care for them, so such people, I think, should have a, a self-support group. Then caring for your emotional needs is very important. So one way of doing it is to keep a journal. So write all your feelings, your thoughts about what is happening and how it's affecting you. That makes a huge difference. It is therapy by itself, keeping a journal. Build in regular breaks from caregiving. So caregiving can be a very... Uh, arduous and uh, very taxing kind of a task. So you need to take care of yourself by taking breaks. Try to continue your hobbies to the extent possible and deal with your guilt. So often I find that people who are carers go through this guilt. Oh, I'm not doing enough. Maybe I should try this holistic medicine. Maybe I should try that. And, uh, you know, whatever I'm doing, he or she is not feeling comfortable. So I need to do more. So this guilt, guilt is a very self-defeating uh, emotion. It does not help you. Forgive yourself for not being perfect. And you have a right to feel upset, disturbed, and determine your limits. Like how far can I go? How much can I stretch? I think these are uh, pointers for carers. Okay, we, so in the end, I would uh, like to just read this poem to you, which is on serenity. Oh, sorry. So fill your bowl to the brim and it will spill. Keep sharpening your knife and it will blunt. Chase after money and security and your heart will never unclench. Care about people's approval and you will be their prisoner. Do your work and then step back. That's the only path to serenity. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, my request, if you can stop sharing your screen. Yeah. There's a, on the top, you would see one. Uh, New share, please. Stop share. Stop. Ma'am, on your Zoom screen, ma'am, you can go to Zoom and yeah, okay, that's done, ma'am. I can see your, I can okay. see you. Uh, thank you so much and thank you to Dr. Kalyana Sundaram also. We have a little bit time, we are almost uh, reaching the end of our uh, webinar, but maybe just a few questions. Now, most of the questions which came in uh, before, where uh, regarding the uh, you know vaccines and other things which sir has already touched upon so we will skip those and there are a few regarding uh, what ma'am has shared just now 
I think uh, many people found that to be uh, something that they are really grappling with, you know, how to manage their mental health. And I'm happy you mentioned about some of the things that can be done. I'm sure even from Samagra, we are aiming to address some of these uh, concerns and also have groups and safe spaces for sharing. Now, uh, with regard to the questions, I will read out uh, uh, very quickly, ma'am, and you can respond. Uh, yeah. To them. Okay. I have read a few cases of psychosis after or during COVID with no previous history of psychotic symptoms. Is there any correlation or is it a coincidence? Just a short uh, response would be good, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, I think we are hearing steroid induced psychosis among some people, but very, very few cases. I would like Dr. K's to comment on it because I think it is a somewhat a medical question. So I think he would be better equipped to do that. Dr. K.S., yeah, could you okay. please? Uh, those already have a history of psychosis, even if it is under control with the medication, they're relatively free of symptoms. Any kind of a stress can exacerbate uh, the symptoms. Okay. A few patients coming with a relapse of psychotic illness for two, three reasons. One, during the COVID period, they become so anxious generally, they discontinue medication. They are running around getting their uh, testing done. They go there to get the RT-PCR test, go to the doctor and take a general medication. They are under the false impression that you're taking other medication for COVID, they need not continue this medication. So they stop and then they relapse. Those who have vulnerability to have a psychotic illness, due to any other factors, either being genetically invulnerable, family history of illness, they've had incipient psychosis. If they indulge in any kind of a drug or alcohol issue or under stress, the psychotic illness can become very evident. Okay, so thank you. The other question is how to manage fear among children? Uh, any of you could, or ma'am, maybe you want to say... Okay, so I think for children, the most important thing is certain predictability in their environment. So if we can keep up the same routine that they had earlier, yes, the school is not there, but during that time, you could think of some creative activities to keep them occupied. But that is one way of making the environment predictable, helps them to deal with fear. The other thing is there has to be an anchor, emotional anchor for the child. So uh, a person with whom the child feels most comfortable, of course, most often it's the mother, uh, most comfortable and trusted. So uh, when they have that fear, I think they should be able to reach the mother and you know talk about it, allowing the child to talk about it or draw about it, you know, uh, all those things would help okay, and, and basically I think you will have to learn how to talk to the child in his or her own language for example he may not understand if you say yoga and do yoga and things like that so maybe in their own way how how you know their fear can be reduced is uh, yeah you need to learn how to talk to them Okay. A related question to it is a lot of us here are uh, parents of children uh, going to school and currently they are just, uh, you know, very restless at home. So how to manage uh, children who are just wanting to play games on the internet and uh, not willing to uh, do other activities and they, they, the parents fear that they may uh, be getting addicted? Yes, I think that's a real concern. And I've seen a lot of adolescents who have got addicted during this period and it's increasing. Uh, I think parents are also helpless because how to keep the child occupied is, a, is a, I think, a big challenge. I think uh, hobbies would come in a long way in that. And I think uh, parents should uh, probably spend more time, you know, playing with them. Maybe then they will get motivated. If you just give, rather than just giving them something to play with, I think if we play with them, maybe it will make a difference. Uh, yeah, it is a challenging thing because 
children are cooped up in the house and how to make it a little more relaxing for them is is a challenge but yes i think you should uh, set limits for watching or i mean uh, playing games video games and uh, uh, being on the screen there has to be screen time limit uh, I, i think parents have to become very strict about it because i have seen the other side what happens to brilliant children who are doing so well academically and then they have just given up their courses you know i think uh, dr kes will remember both of us shared uh, about uh, about uh, uh, you know very bright uh, adolescent who gave up on his course because uh, uh, because he got addicted and uh, ma'am also there are many of the mothers who are working and also simultaneously trying to engage their children so there is some amount of guilt involved in the you know work life balance related aspects if there right. is some that you could say to working mothers and with, especially with young children like i said in the last slide i think i think one is not to feel guilty that you are not perfect i think to remember that these are difficult times even for you and uh, if you make a mistake it's not a, you know it's not going to make so much of difference but yes uh, how can you Uh, manage to take care of the child's needs at the same time see that your self care is not neglected they yeah to strike that balance i know is not easy but i think each of us will have to find our own ways of doing it uh, uh, lastly there are many questions in the chat about how to control anger and any instances of violence now i know that's a very broad uh, area <laughs> you know if there's yes. some simple and i'm sure we could take this up as a specific topic itself because there seems to be a lot of uh, you know comments uh, on how to control anger or emotions in general uh, mm-hmm. during the pandemic mm-hmm. and the second mm-hmm. thing is about the family dynamics so two quick uh, comments on that before we uh, okay okay so i think anger or any other negative emotion the best way to handle it is like i told you in the in my earlier slides about deep breathing abdominal breathing so when there is a rush of emotion the most important thing is to bring down the arousal our arousal our excitement at that time so this deep breathing helps you to bring down the arousal then you can ask yourself a question whether anger is there anything is hurting me or others if it is hurting then is there a alternate way of dealing with it you know can i just smile it away can i just take a break can i just drink some water so there could be many alternate ways in which you can handle it so choose the best way or the easiest way for you to do it and continue so i would suggest of course this is very simplistic in a in a very short you know capsule i have made it but it is helpful it is helpful if you can first reduce the arousal and then look at alternate options okay that's for anger family dynamics <laughs> uh, what about it i mean it's a very broad area again there was a question regarding the domestic violence and instances of family members not getting along because they confined to a yes case. yes yes i think what happens between especially between spouses is each one is looking putting the other in the microscope and watching all the mistakes while before we were not in the same space and each one was working at a different place and you would just come to the uh, come with uh, at the end of the day you would come together but now it is not so and each one is looking at the other what they are doing and constantly in each other's space which is making you more intolerant towards each other i think that's what is happening and people who already have conflict i think it's getting exaggerated all so, right uh thank you i think this would be one of our future webinar topics and we could certainly also gain from some insights once again if you're willing to and uh, yeah. we address some of these broader concerns like that other than that there are uh, some comments appreciating you all both of you for your inputs and uh, very scientific presentation of everything and uh, there were some questions about the safety of vaccines and what can be done and the you know symptoms and all i think that has already been covered so i won't repeat those questions which were already sent earlier 
uh, if there are any any quick comments from both the speakers before I propose the vote of thanks, then you all can share if you would like to say something, something more, or just to promote yeah. some positive. There's a few questions about if you get a COVID infection, you have taken on vaccine. In between the second vaccine, you've got a COVID infection. Should I take a vaccine or not? These are all very critical questions, cannot be ignored. These are things people do not have a right answer because the different people have different kind of messages that is thrust upon them. The current protocol is if you have had a COVID test positive after taking the first vaccination, you wait for three months from the day of your positive testing. You have to wait for three months before you can take the vaccination. With the first vaccination, there's some antibodies are coming up. With COVID positivity, some more antibodies are building up. At that point in time, you cannot take a vaccination. You have to wait for three months. There are several such questions on, practical questions on these things. I'm afraid we do not seem to have the time. So what we could do is we will uh, have them answered and share them with the group so they can have this common information. And uh, since, I mean, we are out of time, we could share that uh, you know, later on. Definitely uh, take up all the questions. But I think more or less we have got a comprehensive uh, idea about the topics that uh, you all intended to address our group on. Thank you to our wonderful speakers, uh, highly experienced. And uh, it's, it's so nice of you to have taken out time and uh, spent this time educating us on some crucial things. And you're surely opening up a lot of uh, you know, areas where we need to think, we need to work on. And you've given us a lot of food for thought to uh, plan our future activities also. So thank you both very much.